newspaper men meet such interesting people. They know the lowdown, now it can be told. I'll tell you quite reliably off the record about some charming people I have known. For I meet politicians and grafters by the score. Killers plain and fancy, it's really quite a bore. Oh, newspaper men meet such interesting people. They wallow in corruption, crime and gore. Tingling ling, city desk, pull the press, pull the press. Extra, extra, read all about it. It's a mess meets the test. Oh, newspaper men meet such interesting people. It's wonderful to represent the press. Media Project gives you some analysis and insight into what's going on in the media and even some thoughtful commentary, we hope, on our better days. I'm Rex Smith here with Rosemary Mayo, Ira Fussfeld, Judy Patrick. We are your media projectors. <laughs> are we projectors or projectiles? This is like detectorists, isn't it? Uh, you know that I'm great not, uh, not TV sure. show? Right? Yeah, yeah. I you're sort not of a, like projectiles. You don't know about detectorists? Don't know about this, oh, these no. are metal detectors, and the guys say, "Oh no, we're not metal detectors. We're detectorists. A machine is the, it's a it's a great <laughs> show." <laughs> All right. Anyway, thank you for joining us, folks, and we will try to raise the level of conversation here beyond. Hard not to after that beginning. <laughs> 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 All right. Artificial intelligence. We should have turned to AI to give us a clue on what we ought to do. Are we doing we in journalism? Uh, we uh, sitting here are now retirees, essentially, more or less from what our field was. But here is the thing. Let me just set the stage by saying there's a letter signed by many of the most respected figures in the industry, in artificial intelligence, that is, the creators of it, who have said this simple statement in its entirety, mitigating the risk of extinction from AI should be a global priority alongside other societal scale risks such as pandemics and nuclear war. So if extinction is on the table, is journalism doing enough to talk about that? What do you think, Rosemary? I think that we're seeing a lot of sensationalism, like, oh, wow, this is like Terminator come to life. And, oh, wow, look what it can do now. Look at what chat GBT has done now. It's written a book. It's written a TV show. You name it. But the actual long and sustained look at it and putting it all in perspective, it reminds me of climate change when that was beginning to be well known as a serious existential threat. Did we cover that? Well, we're still beating ourselves up every week on this show and others about what a bad job we're doing because it's hard. You have to project the good and the bad, put it all in perspective, and still make it engaging and interesting without sensationalizing. That's a big, tall order. Well, I don't know. Ira, how do you get the public's attention? Do you put a big headline on the top of your paper no, every day that says, extinction? I just mark? think that this has sort of snuck up on us, and it shouldn't have, because whatever they're discussing now as to the pros and cons of AI didn't develop overnight. This is years and years and years mm -hmm. of study and of invention and of development, and now all of a sudden, we're running the risk of extinction. So the short answer is I think we, we the media, largely has ignored this. And now we've, we're catching up. And where it goes, if extinction is an accurate and not an inflammatory potential occurrence, then we ought to be covering it like climate change and other things that we're putting more stock in. But let me say this, Judy, this is, I mean, this is actually almost harder than climate change, because at least with climate change, if you're a local journalist, you can see local effects of it. How, if you are running WAMC radio, if you are running a local newspaper, do you cover artificial intelligence as a risk? Right, and you need to, and you have to find where it pops up in your local news coverage. And it will, people nowadays tend to think of artificial intelligence as auto-filling my text replies. And, you know, all oh, that doesn't seem that dangerous. You really do have to convey the potential significance of it. I've seen stories about lawyers using artificial intelligence to craft their arguments before a court and having those be incorrect and made up, entirely made up. We need to point those out. I mean, you see artificially created images. I think it needs to be an ongoing dialogue, but I agree with Ira. It's just so hard to capture the average person's attention. Yeah. I would disagree with Ira that it snuck up on us that we should have known about it. Even the people most involved in AI, the godfather of AI, thought that these sorts of worries were decades away. And the development of the technology has been so incredibly explosive lately that it is a new crisis. Because and I think it should be portrayed that way. 
because right. AI is so good, it is Correct. in effect almost replicating itself. Correct. It is We're, allowing its growth. And, and by one itself. other thing, if I can say this, I agree that we should be covering it well, but we also are involved in it. Journalism is much affected by this. We should be both very transparent about how and when we use it, and I think we should be lobbying for reforms and change and safeguards, which I don't see journalists doing so far. In my job, I see queries from companies that are now offering artificial intelligence to generate an image for editorial if they do not have an image to go with the story. Judy is vice president of editorial development of the New York Press Association, so you're basically representing newspapers around the state, and you're saying that there are industries trying to get the business. There are already vendors in play making the sales pitch that if you need this, or even in the sales version of newspaper, probably any kind of advertising, they can put together a sales package very quickly. But for the editorial side, that is a potentially really serious issue. I mean, we've often thought that artificial intelligence could help us do some of the mundane tasks as long as you have an editor or a series of editors overseeing it. But I see it creeping in. I don't see a lot of people taking it up at this point, but it's a real issue. But you know where it's really affecting local journalism, and it is almost unseen, is on the a business development level, that is the content that is generated by reporters and editors and producers around the country is being digested by AI systems. And that is what is the data that is providing information. So there are now the major news organizations are beginning to look at copyright infringement lawsuits against the AI developers saying this content was developed by our reporters. You can't just digest that into your AI system. That is proprietary information. But that's a business issue, and even that is way out ahead of what's going on. There are so many ways in which it affects people. Two years ago, there was a Blue Ribbon panel. Katie Couric was one of the co-chairs. That's the, the name. But it was funded, I think, by the Aspen Institute, and it was called the Information Disorder Report. And it talked about how society is threatened by information disorder that's way before AI took wow. over. And now we have AI mm -hmm. suddenly in here that is uh, information disorder is at a magnitude, potential magnitude, you know, for misinformation, for the weaponization of information. I just don't Art. think this is where I meant it about it sneaking up on us. We knew that this was going on, we meaning the media writ large. And we knew that there were implications on us, at least short term, such as when I mean, we talked about this months ago about sports stories could be used entirely by computers if you fed in the right information. I just get the sense that it's now only recently that the scope and the potentials for good and bad of AI, again, writ large, is starting to dawn on people. And this story in the New York Times about extinction it must have shaken some people to their core. One would think would have known about this coming up. So did the story, the tech writer for the New York Times, what, several months ago, did an interview with the chat GPT and was horrified that it was expressing love for him, it was expressing, mm -hmm. I wish I could do more than you know just write things. It was alarming and it alarmed the tech writer himself who really was up on all of it. So I think that there's been developments in AI newsworthy developments about how far it's gone in the development that the media has covered well. But the bigger things we have to look at. The way you usually engage the audience is to tell them what they can do or should do about something. And we don't know what they can do or should do about AI any more than we do about climate change. And, and even that's changing in climate change. We do tell people now about recycling and so on, plant trees, all, all the stuff we've been writing about. What do we have about AI? What do you do about the what, Terminator and, coming to kill you? And it's in private hands. You know, people are right. saying this is reminiscent of the development of the atomic bomb. No. Uh, because right after that, the scientists who developed the bomb issued warnings. Robert Oppenheimer is quoted in one analysis that I read from CNN saying, uh, we knew the world would Never not be the, be same. the same. And yeah, but nuclear technology was not readily available to people the way ChatGPT and AI is actually readily available in the private sector. Nuclear technology was in public hands only. And so it was easier to confront the threat of nuclear weapons than it is for AI at this point. One of the big problems is, is it's complicated. It's yeah. sophisticated, it's scientific, it's mathematical, it's complicated. I listened to a podcast with the godfather of AI, and he tried to explain why this has the potential to be so powerful powerful because the computers are trying to gather as much power because more power they have, the better they can learn, the better they can serve you. And 
that eventually can lead to major problems. What can be done about it? Some people think the industry is overreacting. We're all overreacting. We're not going to be extinct. But if you listen carefully to the science of it, you can see the road by which the computers could take over. So would we create a beat? Should there be reporters? You know, that was how we we, we had environment reporters. We had consumer reporters. We create beats for things, right? This is a truth in journalism. You create a beat and you put somebody on it and suddenly there are stories generated that you never could have anticipated by sitting around in a news meeting and trying to brainstorm it. That's the best way to do it. So, yeah, I think people cover Except who's going to do it? The larger media organizations will have the wherewithal to do it, but it won't be done at the Schenectady Gazette or the paper's hour size. Even the Albany Times Union. Why not? Why not? Where are the reporters coming from? Where are the researchers coming from? They don't exist anymore. (laughs) Well, yeah, because the staffs are depleted. It's hard enough to cover school boards, right? So you have to have somebody at the local level level who's going to say, we're not covering cops this month. We're going to do... AI is one thing, but I would say cover flying, the changes on airplanes and people moving around by air. Put somebody on that for one month. I understand the lack of resources and depletion of of all of the things we used to have to go after, but this calls for creative thinking by news here's, decision makers. Here's a way, actually, this fits in with the development of uh, not-for-profit journalism, which we are seeing more of. Did you notice that the New York Times had significant coverage on the front page about the New York State penal system that was produced by the Marshall Project. This is a not-for-profit newsroom. Mm -hmm. Former executive editor of the New York Times, Bill Keller, used to be the editor of the Marshall Project after he left the Times. It's a wonderful news organization. They did significant reporting about problems in the New York State prisons. Problems is putting it mildly. And it was front page story of the New York Times, the same way that the Adirondack Explorer and the Times Union have a relationship so that the Times Union publishes all this great content from the not-for-profit newsroom of the Adirondacks. So uh, that kind of thing might be a way that local journalists could cover something as big as AI, right? If they're specialists because that's what it takes, somebody who can really devote their energy to it. It's a great point because I think we need to change our mindset about what What has to be covered. What has to be covered, what a newspaper should be, what a radio program should be. I think it's an interesting perspective. If you have a small newspaper or a small to medium-sized newspaper, which has already cut back on its coverage of local news, and you say, to use your example, well, let's not cover cops for a while, (laughs) What remaining subscribers we have will be lining up out the door to leave us because that's what one of the things that we do. We can still report cop news. It's, re- it's easy to do, and you have to have that in your local newspaper. If you took that out, A, would you not only not have it, but what would you replace it with while your reporter is doing the investigative work that will take time and thus keep him or her out of the page. In other words, there'll be nothing but wire copy. So, Ira, you are advocating a model that has seen the decline and fall of local news over the last 20 years. I'm trying to slow it from finally dying for good. And I'm saying take a chance we're dying, so you might as well grab for something new and different see if that works. Hmm. You know, it's not an issue I think you could, that the one reporter shop can fix. Newspaper, they has one reporter covering it, but I think it's something that the power could be the collaboration. You could have yeah, something. Several in, newspapers Yeah, several together. newspapers working together, opening up some space. I mean, sometimes yep. that's one of the issues is a newspaper doesn't want to open up the space. They don't want to use the extra newsprint. Right. I, mean, I think you need to convey the importance of covering this issue and all levels of an organization, at a radio station, a TV station, that, yeah, we're going to have to do this, and then we're going to devote some resources to it. And you have to make the case from a reality perspective that, yeah, you still have to get those wedding announcements and obits in the paper as well. The collaboration that you're talking about happens among chains. It's one of the only good things you can say about Gannett newspapers, uh, oh, which is the largest chain in the country. Saying anything good yeah, about I know. <laughs> but they are making use. There are statewide teams now that do deeper journalism that make them available. For example, I look and I look at Gannett papers every week as I create the Upstate American. And I look all around the country. And so, for example, if you look at Alabama, the three Gannett papers there share some strong yeah, reporters this. and they will actually publish material there. Same thing for a state like Indiana, where the Indianapolis Star is in the center and there are probably half dozen other Gannett papers in Indiana uh, that together could do a decent piece that would relate to how AI affects Hoosiers, I guess. I don't know what the comparable situation would be in a place like New York's capital region where you don't have chains involved, really. Well, here, here's one other thing, too, and this is a generational issue. Um, 
investigative reporting has never been done by teams of uh, allotted, dedicated investigative reporters. That's very rare. It's like the New York Times and the Washington Post can afford that. Investigative reporting is always done by reporters who do the work of investigation, in addition to covering cops or whatever. That's the meat and potatoes of newspapers. And they put in extra hours, and they become totally crazed and involved and immersed in their topic, and they produce great work. And right. it's exploitative. And I understand that now millennials especially are saying we have to keep our life in balance, and I'm only going to work to rule. But great investigative reporting requires that you do more, that you have to care about a story and go after it. And that means we have to hire people like that. I think they're in very short supply. That's right. You know, what I used to say to reporters was you need to have be working on three different levels. Yeah. Uh, you got what you're working on today, what you're working on for Sunday, and what you're working on uh, for three months out. Right. And and I always encourage people, there's always downtime where you're waiting for that call back. Mm-hmm. While, you, while you're waiting for that call back, you can do something else or you can go for another donut. I mean, Mm -hmm. I think that really efficient (laughs) reporters, they do put in the extra time and the extra effort, but they also make use of every minute that they're at work. Yeah, time management is huge. It's something that should be uh, emphasized more in in colleges, not just newsroom. And, you know, the other thing is all this bemoaning our lack of resources and downsizing, and there's only, you know, one of us to cover what four people used to. It actually works against doing above and beyond. I'm sorry, the Bill Marimol model of you stay 15 hours when only 12 are required. That's how great journalism got done. Always has been true, always in American journalism. Bill Marimol, she's quoting, was the longtime editor of the Philadelphia Inquirer, managing editor before that. Terrific journalist. Then went to the Baltimore Sun. Baltimore Sun, I'm sorry. That's right. That's what I wanted to say. But actually, I brought him into the Times Union newsroom some years ago to do a workshop for our staff because he was just such a Two-time Pulitzer Prize winner in investigative reporting, yeah. and that was it. He was methodical in time management. Um, he had a clear view of what could be done and what you couldn't do. You just cut that out, but you go after a clear target. And so AI and climate change both seem like topics that could be covered in this way. What about the debt ceiling? Talking about big stories, uh, we have just gone through, by the way, folks, if you have thoughts on anything that we're saying, media at WAMC.org. Share your views. Media at WAMC.org. We're here with Rosemary Armeo, Ira Fussfeld, Judy Patrick, and I'm Rex Smith, and we are the Media Project. So we have just gone through the uh, paroxysms of legislation that have been negotiating between the White House and the Republican-led House over debt ceiling. And I wonder, this panel's assessment of what we thought about the coverage, how did journalists covering that do, do we think? Any reactions? I think that the media, although it attempted to do it, was not strong enough or clear enough in describing what the debt ceiling was and that the passage of the debt ceiling bill was required to pay to pay off bills that we've already pay off what we've already spent. It was too often portrayed, and they bought into the Republicans' desire to cut spending, etc. When the cutting of spending in the future had nothing to do with paying off this debt and paying their credit cards, and I'm not sure if the public didn't understand it or if there was the the right was was better at trying to put their own stamp on it. But I just think that the public, this is something that the public should be able to understand. You get a credit card bill, you already paid, you already bought and paid for it. Now you got to write the check. And that's essentially what is going on here. And it wasn't portrayed that way, I believe. I think a lot of people portray it that way. But the problem is once you start to make that the centerpiece of your coverage, it sounds like, it feels like taking sides, doesn't it? If you're pointing well, out that... but this that is the, just explaining it. This is this is yeah. one where this is not a... I, I think the public does get it. I think we explain that. Every story I read about the debt ceiling that was brought up, every single one, Ira, I think the public does get it. I think it's the media is being blamed for the Democrats' fault, and yes, I am taking sides. The first thing that happens is the president goes, I'm not negotiating. And of course, he did end up negotiating, which was the wise and prudent thing to do, but it makes him look weak. And so it looks like we're taking sides against Biden when, in fact, it was his error. And the Democrats, who did have a chance, many chances to do something about the debt ceiling when they were in control, did not, even including in the last lame duck session. They could have simply said, yeah, Trump, we'll pass your debt ceiling limit, but first you have to promise that we're not going to deal with this issue again for the next four years. They didn't do that. They just passed it, like you said, because it's just paying the bills. Here's where I think journalism failed in this part, and that is in what you just said, uh, assessing that uh, the president was in error to say, I'm not negotiating. I studied negotiation technique, actually as part of my 
sorry, my leadership training from Hearst Corporation, uh, a lot. And I think that was a negotiating stance. I think saying I'm not going to negotiate, okay. um, it was actually great leadership because he made sitting down to negotiate a huge give. And so that was that set the stage. And it is interesting that I think, therefore, more Democrats supported raising the cap than Republicans in the House of Representatives because, and maybe this is wrong for journalists to point out, Democrats got the better deal. That is yeah, Joe no, Biden's I... insistence that I'm not going to do that. I'm, oh, OK, I'm going to give it up. I think it was uh, clever. That would have been a good story. Yeah, that yeah, would have. And I that. never heard that. I, I heard the opposite, though. It looks really I was weak. a pretty good political analyst. We did analyst hear as that the Democrats <laughs> got way more than the Republicans. We heard that over and over again. Mm -hmm. The the other thing, though, is that were were the people covering the story really up on all the details? I don't know how how they got their information or or were expected to get it, but the whole thing, the deal with Joe Manchin, that came as a surprise to me. That whole gas pipeline through Appalachia. Yeah. How did that get into a, a debate about debt limit and spending? And then once again, we're probably going to find out after it's all said and done what's actually in the bill because things get tucked inside that we don't know about. Like in New York State and the legislature and the budget, things happen that we the uh, last in, minute in terms of transparency. Doors. But yeah. wasn't it also a little bit of a horse race coverage as well? Like mm -hmm. who's ahead, who's yes. behind, who's in a better negotiating position? And it was just so long. I, 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 I got so tired of the debt ceiling discussion. And you know, I, I'm, I'm sorry about it, but man, if I If you're tired on of it. that beat, though, if you're the White House oh, yeah. beat, how do you combat that when your producer, your editor is saying to you, what do you got? I don't have anything. So uh, who's, how are they doing? Uh, how are Can you I put in a, a good word for horse race coverage? Why is that? A, <laughs> why do we continually bash ourselves for that? Yeah. I'm sorry, Kevin McCarthy, whether he won or lost is essential. It, it, his leadership, his continued role as speaker was contingent on how this turned out. Why should we not cover that? I think we should agree, but we should also cover what the real impact mm -hmm. is. But what, what I saw throughout the whole coverage was we would, uh, uh, McCarthy or one of Biden's spokesmen would come out with a statement, and the statement was part of their negotiation. They were, they were negotiating over the airways or over in print, and we would take it like it was serious. And, it, um, it, and, and in fact, it was just negotiating. We really needed to get what was going on behind the scenes, what was really happening. And I'm not sure anybody had a real sense of what was really happening behind the scenes. Maybe we'll, we'll see a TikTok of, of that or a, mm -hmm. a rehash of what, how it all went down to find out what really happened in these last mm -hmm. two weeks. Speaking of how journalism is done, that is, you're right that that's what people needed to have, but you only have that if you have reporters on the beat who have developed longtime sources who can call up someone deep into the negotiations and say, so what's really going on? And that is a lot of what is being lost in one beat after another across the country as staffs are shrinking. Right at local newspapers. Now, in, in Washington, you know, it seems like there's a new startup every week, right? Yeah, there's like 50 people following Kevin McCarthy around, and right. whatever he says in a gaggle, really, is it useful? Is it is it <laughs> adding to the truth of things? Yeah, exactly. So it's not... So, so what do we do, not, not cover that? Have one person cover it, and then the other 49 can cover AI. There you go. <laughs> or climate change. Yeah. There you go. Uh, talk about artificial intelligence. We are... <laughs> We used to think that at the state capitol, you know, there, but when there were three dozen reporters in the Legislative Correspondents Association that, you know, why are we all sitting here waiting for the Senate Majority Leader to come out and lie to us <laughs> from a closed door meeting? And it was we felt stupid because the floor was hard and cold. It was the middle of the night and we knew that we were all going to get the same story. But the fear and was... And AP was there, too. And AP was there, right. Uh, and, well, when I first came here, UPI also. But the fact was you thought, well, if I don't go to the speaker's press conference, if I'm not there when the governor invites us in, it's going to be suggested that I don't really care about it and they won't talk to me in the future. Uh, you have to show up, supposedly, to be known, to... I don't know. It was. It seemed well, like it was worse. Well, development, and there's something to that. Yeah. You can cover something and then not write about it or broadcast it. So just before we go, we need to talk about something going on overseas to remind people of the importance uh, and the danger uh, of journalism in some places. We forget about this in the United States sometimes. An Iranian journalist, a woman, has gone on trial behind closed doors. You know, we have open courtrooms in this country on charges uh, linked to her coverage of the Kurdish Iranian woman who's uh, who died in custody last year, you know, the woman who uh, violated the dress code and she was killed by police. 
coverage of that now by an Iranian journalist named Elahe Mohammadi covering her funeral has now she's now been charged with colluding with hostile powers for the coverage of that. They say the CIA orchestrated these uh, leaderless demonstrations that turned Iran into 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 an uproar for for months and months and the journalists are being blamed for the protests. There's actually two women. Two. One yes. one was put on trial the other is about to go on trial. Uh, their their lawyers are not allowed to participate. Their families were not allowed into the courtroom and it's before a judge known as the hanging judge. In Iran. It's a very serious situation. It does point out how how brave you have to be to be a journalist, how important it is to get out the truth. Um, did did uh, coverage of the death of this Kurdish woman at the hands of the morality police, did it? Is it the coverage that led to the protests or was it the treatment of the, of the woman? That's essential to journalism. Yeah, it is something we take for granted here. Yep. And, and it is outrageous that you can't be a reporter in that country and and not go to prison or not lose your life. It is it is something we in America need to be very thankful for. So when I when I say I want journalists to work overtime without pay to do a story, see what they give up in other countries, their freedom and their lives. Wonderful point, Rosemary. And that's all we have time for today. Good point to end on. Rosemary Armeo, Ira Fussfeld, Judy Patrick, and I'm Rex Smith. With gratitude to our producer, David Gustina, for all he does to make this happen. And to you folks for joining us once again this week on The Media Project. They organized a union to get a living wage. They joined with other actors upon a living stage. Now newspaper men are such interesting people. When they know they've got a people's fight to The Media Project is a national production of WAMC Northeast Public Radio. This week's projectors include former Times Union editor and current Substack columnist of the Upstate American, Rex Smith. Judy Patrick, former editor of the Daily Gazette and vice president for editorial development for the New York Press Association. Rosemary Armeo, investigative journalist and adjunct professor at RPI in New Albany and Daily Freeman publisher emeritus, Ira Fussfeld. You can listen to The Media Project anytime at wamcpodcast.org or anywhere you get your podcast. Thanks for listening. Publishers have worries, for publishers must go to working folks for readers and to big shots for their dough. Now publishers are such interesting people. It could be prostitution, I don't know. Ting-a-ling-a-ling, circulation, ting-a-ling-a-ling, advertising, get those readers, get that payoff. What a headache, what a mess. Oh, publishers are such interesting people. Let's give free cheers for freedom of the press. <laughs>